Me uh, and my partner Matt, we run a fund based out of LA called Blockhead Capital. Um, we're a thesis-driven fund, and Decred is one of our holdings. Um, anything that I say up here is not financial advice. Uh, please do your own research, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All the disclaimers. Um, by show of hands, uh, who here owns uh, any type of cryptocurrency? Literally everybody. <laughs> Um, again, by a show of hands, who here owns Decred? Almost everybody. Um, so I was planning to give a little bit of a longer talk uh, tonight about the virtues of Decred, um, some, of, some of the benefits um, that Decred has over Bitcoin because of its hybrid consensus mechanism, uh, hybrid proof of work, proof of stake. Uh, but it seems like everybody here really knows what's going on, so I'm not going to get into it too much. Um, but as you know, one of the awesome features that you get with the hybrid consensus mechanism is the ability to upgrade the network. Uh, very recently, the network was upgraded with privacy features, which is the purpose of our talk here tonight. And on that note, we'd like to invite up Jake to give our keynote on the new privacy features in Decred. Good evening, everyone. I was really surprised to see the show of hands that almost everyone in the audience holds Decred. That was uh, really surprising because it, a lot of meetups I've been to, it's, you know, maybe it's a half and half kind of thing. Some people know and some people don't. So as a result of this information, I'm going to sort of switch up the talk just a little bit. So what I'm going to be talking about tonight is Decred in general and then Decred privacy specifically. Based on the fact that the, uh, you know, the numbers seem to indicate that a lot of you already either own Decred or nominally understand it, I'm not going to dwell on the basics. I'm going to sort of, I'm going to breeze through that a little bit so we can get a little bit more time with the privacy stuff. So uh, this wonderful graphic is uh, thanks to our designers who are in Estonia and I didn't have to tell them anything other than it's privacy and you mix things together and they generated this graphic. It's, it's wonderful, and if, you, if you're into fluid dynamics, uh, it, it reminds you of a vortex. Who am I? I'm Jake Okampayat. I am the project lead, uh, at least until I automate myself out of a job for the Decred project. And what we're trying to do with Decred is obviously you know, larger in scope than a lot of other cryptocurrencies. Other cryptocurrencies are trying to address you know, narrow slice problem X, and we're trying to sort of, uh, you know, improve the game. There's, you know, there games underpin our societies uh, that operate right now. You know, if you run a successful company, you are a good game operator and you found a way to rig the game to your benefit. And uh, I'm just trying to uh, sort of broaden that, uh, you know, that view and make it more generally applicable with Decred. And I'm also the Company Zero CEO. So Company Zero is uh, the main, you know, one of the primary contractors for the project. And we, we deliver a lot of back-end code. We don't really focus so much on the user interface side of things. So we're building out the back-end so that Decred can do cool stuff. What are we trying to do with Decred? Anyone who's already familiar with the project knows that we're trying to create a superior store of value. We're trying to do this uh, you know, on three fronts. Or three fronts. We're trying to create security uh, in, the, in the sense that we are resistant to majority attacks, which I'll, which I'll talk about a little bit more. We're adaptable in that the consensus rules are not fixed. Uh, Bitcoin has come quite far with very little changes to its original set of consensus rules. And in, you know, in their case, they evolved by soft forking. We don't subscribe to that school of thought and we evolve through generic consensus changes, whether that's a soft fork or a hard fork, we really don't give a fuck. Um, in terms of sustainability, what we're trying to do is we're trying to build something that can last decades or potentially centuries. And the way we're doing this is by seeing what didn't work with other projects. Uh, I participated in the Bitcoin, uh, you know, the Bitcoin ecosystem for quite some time. And I spent several million dollars building out BTC Suite uh, with, you know, with the developers I now work with on, on Decred. And it was a pretty thankless job and it uh, really didn't go anywhere and I just ended up with a big sort of, you know, burned hole in my pocket at the end of that uh, endeavor. So we're trying to create infrastructure that prevents this, you know, this uh, tragedy of the commons failure mode. People need to be, be paid to do useful work to build out, a, you know, a network like this. And 
this is really all about the long run. This isn't about the short run. Uh, I'm not here to, you know, uh, exit, you know, what is it, uh, fail fast and get big. I really, I'd rather grow slowly and, you know, make it perfect. And that's, uh, that's the approach we're taking with uh, Decred that differs in a lot of, you know, in a lot of ways from a conventional uh, venture capital backed company approach. How do we do this? We have a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake algorithm, which I expect no, you know, most of you are already at least nominally familiar with. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to take the strengths and the weaknesses of both proof of work and proof of stake. And by combining these two mechanisms of, you know, for consensus, we can wash out the weaknesses and pick up all of the gains. So in the case of proof of work, one of the major shortcomings is, is that if somebody can fabricate uh, integrated circuits way, way more cheaply and efficiently than you or I, they can effectively take over the network. So the consensus algorithm in a pure proof of work network can be taken over by the people who fabricate these circuits. That has happened in Bitcoin and the vast majority of hash power is, is not only based in China, but uh, you know, it's, it, it's owned by Chinese individuals of, and uh, corporations. And that process is, uh, I see it as, as counterproductive. The idea is, is with a consensus algorithm is that you want everyone to be able to participate in some way. Maybe not everybody adds the same thing to the network, but just having everyone in one country take it over is really counterproductive and it makes for a crappy consensus algorithm. In the case of proof of stake, the major shortcoming of proof of stake is that it's kind of like feudalism. Like if you own 10% of the coins when the project starts, you're always going to own 10% of the income from the, uh, you know, from the subsidy. So we wanted to wash out the feudalism a bit and, uh, you know, but still have the meritocracy component of proof of work. And what this is really all about is, uh, to me, the, and everyone sees something a little different in Decred, which is, I, I find reassuring, but to me, this is really all about games. It's about creating a fairer game. What attracted me to Bitcoin was that it created a fairer game fairer than the, the fiat financial system. You can't have your account confiscated, people can't stop you from sending transactions, and uh, no either you know, central bank or nation state government can arbitrarily inflate that value away. So as a function of that, uh, we figured we'd extend the game to something that was really concrete and a problem for Bitcoin, which is uh, decision making. The governance system that's present in Bitcoin is really, it's a, you know, it's a thinly veiled central planning committee. And I know some people may beg to differ and want to argue with me about it all day, but I've been there, done that, I've seen the inside of the beehive, and that's, what's, that's how it goes. There's maybe five or ten people who are really in charge, and everybody else is effectively a peon or a serf in that feudal system. So I want to get away from that. I'd, I'm more interested in making the decision-making process an open and permissionless one. The way we split our block reward is we split it 60% uh, proof of work, 30% proof of stake, 10% uh, treasury subsidy. And the idea here was to subsidize proof of work the largest because you actually have to buy integrated circuits and you have to maintain them and you have to you know, uh, pay for the electricity, the upkeep, and so on. And then eventually these things get old and you gotta throw them out and buy new ones. So we didn't want to really shortchange proof of work because if you do, then the security from it is crap. In the case of proof of stake, we didn't want the proof of stake uh, semi-passive returns to be too high. In, in that case, you create sort of a, you know, it's more of a pyramid scheme than it is something that's slow and gradual and builds over time. We want people to show up and stick around, and, and that's why we kept the proof of stake at 30% as opposed to making it higher. And then the project treasury of 10%, um, the approach that, or you know, my, my thought is uh, to go kind of old school US government on this and say that the idea here is if you can't do it for 10%, you probably shouldn't be doing it. And that's worked out so far. I mean, it's very easy to start turning up the tax rate and just bleeding everybody dry to, you know, build the next whiz bang thing that nobody needs. And we didn't really want to run that course. We wanted to try to build something sustainable so that you know, everyone can benefit and uh, it, people like me who build the infrastructure don't get screwed in the process and you know, just end up spent, you know, burning huge amounts of money to really get not a lot of output. So how does this process work? Bitcoin is uh, proof of work. It's a sortition on hash power. To have a sortition on hash power, what you end up doing is um, you have one CPU, one vote, 
And then if you own 10% of that hash power, it stands to reason that you roughly win 10% of those block rewards that come from a pure proof of work algorithm. In our case, what we wanted to do is we wanted to, uh, to emulate that, but in the staking context. So it begs the question, okay, there's a, there's a mining difficulty and there's a sortition, so how do we project that onto proof of stake? What we end up doing is we end up, instead of having a target block time, we have a target uh, pool size for, you know, for, these, uh, you know, for these tickets. And the target pool size we chose was about 41,000 tickets. We did this because it, uh, it wasn't too large and it wasn't that difficult a database to maintain. So it was pretty quick and it seemed you know, decentralized enough. We didn't want to make it 5,000 because that was too low. We didn't want to make it you know, 500,000 because then you end up having uh, too many tickets in the ticket pool and uh, you, have, you need more votes. It's, it's a mess in, in the blocks. So it's a nice balance we struck with 40, 40, or roughly 41,000 tickets in the ticket pool for the target size. The, and then instead of there being a target, uh, you, know, uh, you know, instead of a difficulty for mining with proof of work, we have a ticket difficulty or stake difficulty, uh, and that's the ticket price. And that goes up and down and adjusts so that there is an, you know, a target pool size that's maintained. That manages everybody's expectations. It creates a sortition on uh, proof of stake and that emulates to a very large degree what happens with proof of work. Ultimately, the people who are involved in the proof of stake layer, it's an opt-in layer, and what it's used for is for block approval. For example, if proof of work miners start to misbehave, it's possible for the proof of stake to invalidate their block rewards. Now, the idea with invalidating block rewards is it de-incentivizes bad behavior. And that's really the best we can do in a cryptocurrency network. Trying to, you know, uh, send the police to arrest the person who is, you know, uh, doing crappy stuff with proof of work really doesn't work on the internet. You know, you can't send people over the internet to arrest somebody who's mining blocks. So that's right out. So in lieu of that, we, you know, we de-incentivize that behavior. The other thing that you get to, uh, get to do when you are participating in the, in the proof of stake layer is you get to deal with... Uh, Consensus changes. Over time, we're going to change the rules. Uh, in order to grow and evolve as a technological network, we need to change the rules every so often. The rules aren't always going to stay the same. We might find great new improvements. We might find new technology like privacy, and we might want to add it. And when we do add it, in a lot of cases, it involves a consensus change, one or more of them. And last but not least, there's the project, question of project management. The other thing proof of stake allows you to do is to direct that 10% treasury to uh, projects that you feel are, you know, are meaningful and worthwhile. Uh, I've, been the, uh, you know, I've been the steward of these funds for several years and I've been incredibly thrifty with it. Um, the, idea, the idea here is just to <clears throat> excuse me, avoid uh, wasting money on things. And so what I did is I tried to delay decisions on major things that I felt like I couldn't make a good decision for the group with. And uh, I feel like I've done a pretty good job delaying those and instead getting to, you know, deferring these decisions to the community. Like for example, hiring a PR firm. I hired a PR firm a while ago and I kind of just sort of threw a dart and I don't feel like I did a particularly good job. So we ended up, you know, putting that on, you know, up for vote and we've done that with several other uh, proposals to date. Now let's get to privacy. So that's enough warm up and uh, review. What we put up here is a quote from the Constitution. The Constitution is really an expectation management document for Decred. Trying to expect that a, uh, that a you know, sort of a, an English language Constitution is really gonna project down into consensus rules is pretty unreasonable. So, th so the idea here is really just to manage your expectations. If you show up and you go, what the hell's the deal with Decred and privacy? You know that it's, that, you know that their, their privacy and security are priorities, and they shall be balanced with the complexity of the implementations. Additional privacy and security technology shall be implemented on a continuing and incremental basis, both proactively and on demand in response to attacks. The idea here being that if you show up, you know we're going to start adding this stuff. We're going to keep adding this stuff. We're not just going to stop because we feel like it. And we're also, uh, you know, we're, all, we're also not just going to start because somebody is, you know, concerned trolling. And it begs the question, why privacy? Why does privacy matter? Privacy matters in a very big way. And, uh, you know, 
I, Decred, and nation state governments recognize this. There's an enormous amount of money that gets spent on, uh, on technology that gives privacy or strips privacy. For example, you know, you ask the question, how many, you know, how many US tax dollars have been spent developing stealth technology for aircraft or on developing satellite technology to strip the privacy of people who are walking around on the streets? And so privacy really matters. But it begs the question also, why does it matter? Privacy matters because ultimately all of us are involved in sort of an implicit information war. Knowing what someone is doing right now gives you the ability to determine or, you know, or, you know uh, estimate or guess what they're going to do next. So if someone can continuously surveil you, then they can know in advance what you're going to do next. So for example, if someone knows the route I take from my office to my house, they can ambush me along that route and fuck me up pretty badly. So, so privacy matters in a way that m most people might not think about. Most people might think, oh, I got my smartphone, I'm on Facebook, I'm on Twitter, I'm doing my thing. And uh, if somebody's monitoring that, they're going to know where you are, they're going to know what you're doing, they're going to be able to outmaneuver you and ultimately win in an implicit information war. So privacy is really all about uh, drawing a line and, and creating a, you know, a self-sovereign space in the context of this information war that we're all sort of sucked into by merit of existing on planet Earth as sentient beings. And we're trying to take this privacy and leverage it for the project. This isn't just about personal privacy. This is about privacy as a matter of course for the project. By adding privacy for the individuals in the project, we strengthen the project by making the people participating in the project resistant to these attacks that I just you know, ran through uh, from people who want to strip your privacy. So uh, you know, if we're going to make decisions as a group, one thing that's very common is to figure out who the members of that group are, profile them, track them, and manipulate them. And that's how Congress and the Senate work, if you're familiar with, with all of that here in the US. And uh, we, call, you know, we, we, we call it lobbying, but it's really bribery. And uh, that process is based on knowing who makes the decisions and how they make the decisions. And then you can go to those people who make the decisions and pay them to make the decisions you want, as opposed to the decisions they would otherwise make. This also allows us to adapt as a project. By freeing ourselves, or at least making, you know, making our project nominally resistant to these, to these manipulations, we can evolve in a way that we would otherwise not be able to. It also makes it more sustainable because if the project evolves in a crappy way, the, the stakeholders really make the rules. If the stakeholders collectively vote to make you know, really bad rules, it's going to negatively impact the project and it's going to crater the, you know, all the effort that people have put into the project to build it and make it into something you know, great. This is a very compressed slide. I'm going to try to be brief here. Uh, I wrote a 3,000 word blog entry that you may or, not have, may or may not have read about the privacy technology present in other cryptocurrencies. I compared Monero, Zcash, the Mimblewimble coins, Grin and Beam, Bitcoin and Dash privacy. And the reason I did this is that it's important to contextualize what we have ended up doing with Decred and where we're planning on going with Decred in terms of privacy. Monero uses Ring CT, which is Ring Signatures and Confidential Transactions. This has a relatively moderate complexity. Um, it's on by default for all transactions. So this is a very, you know, I would argue that this is the strongest privacy you can get in, you know, in a cryptocurrency context for privacy right now. But it has a major drawback. I'm not going to talk too, too much about the, uh, you know, it creates plausible deniability in terms of which transactions are spent to, uh, to create a new transaction. But there's a major drawback to this, which is that it breaks pruning. Where, where when I say pruning, I mean the ability to discard either old blocks or old transactions. If we fast forward 20 years and we go, how does the blockchain work 20, 20 years from now? You certainly don't want to be required to keep transactions from 20 years ago because you can't tell if they're spent. So that is something that I view as a major shortcoming of Monero, despite the fact that the technology is pretty good overall. Because we're trying to build something that works on either a multi-decade or multi-century timescale, we don't want to be required to go back 20 years and keep every transaction you know, from the past to the present because that just it creates an unreasonable burden on the network. 
Zcash has a similar problem, but they use a different technology to, you know, to achieve their privacy. They use uh, zero-knowledge proofs, these things called ZK snarks. It's a very powerful hammer. Uh, it's a hammer that solves many different problems. You know, some people say that uh, uh, to every hammer, uh, a problem is a nail. And uh, this really is a hammer that can hit most nails in terms of privacy. But there's some major drawbacks, one of them being that the code is really quite complex. Uh, the library that implements ZK snarks is tens of thousands of lines of code. And not only that, it's code that's very difficult to audit. You need to, you need to effectively be an academic or have a, you know, a master's level understanding in mathematics and or computer science to audit this code. And uh, you know, I'm, I'm a bright guy and so are the people I work with. We would have to take months out of our time just to audit this code to make sure that it was proper. So we, we passed on ZK snarks for that reason. Further, it has the same problem as Monero in that because what it does, it obfuscates the sender, receiver, and amount of shielded transactions. That's not all the transactions. And when you do that, if you can't tell which transactions are spent, once again, same problem as Monero, you can't prune the blockchain. So 20 years on, you still have to keep every single shielded transaction that Zcash has ever made in order to be able to spend, uh, you know, potentially spend from one of these transactions. Now, if we look at Grin and Beam, Grin and Beam uh, take a different approach. They drastically change the way transactions are signed. It's pretty novel. I thought it was pretty. It was a pretty cool proposal. And what this does is this allows you to uh, arbitrarily aggregate transactions. So, for example, if you know the people in the crowd generate 50 transactions, you can take all those transactions and merge them into a single block, such that you can't tell which inputs and which outputs are linked at all. And that's as a, you know, that's a function of changing the way the transactions are signed. It's a very, you know, it's a very uh, novel approach. They also use uh, confidential transactions. So the, uh, the amounts are private, all these things are merged together, but there's a, you know, in this case, there's a major shortcoming, which is that you don't get many privacy guarantees. You get the likelihood that you're going to have privacy, but you don't get the certainty. And what I mean there is, is that if someone is monitoring this network and you have 50 of these transactions, they get aggregated into a block and mined, someone can monitor this network in multiple points and potentially see each of these 50 transactions before they get aggregated into a block, undoing a lot of what, you know, what, I, what, I, uh, what I believe uh, is the privacy gain from using this system. So that's a, that's a major shortcoming of uh, Grin and Beam. Uh, it's, it, it is, however, pruning compatible, and further, it actually proactively prunes its blockchain. So from an efficiency and scalability standpoint and future proofing, it's, it's well built, but the lack of guarantee of security guarantees as opposed to sort of security probabilities is something that, you know, th that I find challenging. There's also some limitations in terms of scripting. That is that, you know, uh, Bitcoin and Decred and most other cryptocurrencies that are based on Bitcoin have an embedded scripting language. You can't really uh, you can't really port that from those projects into these Mimblewimble coins, uh, and that's because of the way they had to change the structure of the transaction signing. Bitcoin is pretty limited in terms of its privacy features, at least in the core client. But uh, Wasabi Wallet uh, created their zero link protocol, and what they do is they use a Xiaomi and Coin Join to uh, join together transactions, and that is effectively there's a centralized mixer and then you can mix coins with people, and it actually, uh, you know, I'll get to it shortly, but it operates similarly to how uh, we operate with, uh, you know, with Decred, but it uses blind signatures. So blind signatures are old technology. It's from the 80s, and uh, it's very well understood, very well studied. It's very simple. Now, the downside to it is, is that it's simple, it's straightforward, and all of that, but it relies on Tor because you have to go back to the server multiple times and you need to conceal your routing path from uh, you know, passive observers. Anyone who's familiar with Tor knows that it is engineered to not, to not be private from a global passive adversary. And anyone who's familiar with what global passive adversary means knows that is basically code for NSA. So the NSA can, uh, can figure out who is sending what over Tor and because that system is relied upon for privacy here, de-anonymize uh, these Xiaomi and coin joins that are done uh, via, you know, a Wasabi wallet. And Dash uses uh, something that's, you know, and I, I put Dash last because I feel like, you know, their privacy tech is the weakest of the five, is that they use a distributed coin join process. So coin join is a non-custodial process where you merge transactions together. 
But the, the challenge is, is if you do a vanilla coin join, the server knows where the inputs came from and where the corresponding outputs go. So that's obviously bad for privacy. It's just a straight up, uh, you know, it's a straight up weakness. And what this means is that individual master nodes where these distributed coin joins happen can strip the privacy so that they can effectively undo those coin joins. Now, because it's distributed and it's shuffled around between various master nodes, there, there are some you know, protections that you get from that. That is that you'd need you know, a, a sizable chunk of the network colluding to you know, de-anonymize you. But there are some definite concerns regarding who holds how much Dash uh, when you consider the instamine that, that occurred with Dash back when it was launched. So that is the summary of these other five projects. And uh, let's get on to the decred part because that's a little bit more interesting. So as I was saying, Monero and Zcash provide a lot of security uh, in, diff in two different ways. But they, uh, you know, they're more complex than say Bitcoin or you know, uh, you know, Bitcoin or Dash, and they're not prunable. The prunability is really the deal breaker for me. I, I recognized this back in like 2016, 2017, which is, you know, we could have implemented ring signatures or zk snarks or you know, uh, or any of that in Decred. In fact, we still can, but it comes with these consequences. 20 years on, you're still going to have to keep all the transactions and. To me, that's just an unacceptable trade-off. So what is different about decred privacy? We tried to, we tried to in the same way we approach decred on three, on three fronts, we're trying to approach uh, you know, privacy on three fronts, which is we're trying to make it sustainable so that it st things stay prunable and it's straightforward to audit and make sure that there's no, say, silent inflation or stealth inflation. This is something I didn't really touch on because there's so much on that uh, one privacy slide that, that, you know, that I was just on. Um, a, a major shortcoming of, uh, say, confidential transactions with both, both the Mimble Wimble coins and Monero use is that it is possible for stealth inflation to occur. Stealth inflation is the process where someone with a quantum computer, whether, I don't know, whether they're an extraterrestrial or they are uh, a, people in a government facility somewhere underground, grind out the priv keys from pub keys that are published and then can arbitrarily inflate the supply of these currencies. So while uh, publicly there is the technology to do this is not available, that to me is, is not very helpful in terms of creating a reasonable guarantee that it's not available privately uh, to, to certain uh, p powerful nation state actors. Um, in terms of simplicity, we wanted to keep the privacy solution simple because as soon as you start adding complexity, you create ways to fuck up and you know have have things you know bite you in the bite you in the ass later, and we didn't want that for decred. We wanted to try to keep the comp the complexity minimal, and the out you know the quality of the output high. Primitive wise, well, you know when it comes to cri you know uh, cryptographic uh, code or cryptography in general, I'm really a big fan of using common primitives, the you know things that you've used over and over again and are you know totally standard. In terms of keeping it incremental, what I wanted to do is to make sure that it's just a piece at a time. We don't need to, it, we don't need to design the system in one go. We can just add a piece at a time because we can change the consensus rules and just keep doing that uh, you know, indefinitely. So what did we end up doing? We ended up implementing Coin Shuffle Plus Plus. And this is based on the P2P Mixing and Unlinkable Bitcoin Transactions paper by uh, Ruffin, Moreno Sanchez, and Kate. And the, the draw here is, is that it's simple. It's very common primitives, and it's, you know, each of these primitives has proven to work. Just to run you through it very briefly is people subscribe to a mix. Uh, it, it, they, they register to mix. Then they, uh, everyone does uh, all of the pairs in the group do a, uh, a pairwise key exchange. You use that key exchange to generate a session key. You use those session keys negotiated with your peers in the mix to create an obfuscated vector everyone publishes the obfuscated vector, you use that vector to create a system of, of n equations and n variables you know, when you have n peers, and then that system of equations can be solved to generate n output messages, which are the payout addresses for, uh, you know, for uh, a, a uh, coin shuffle plus plus transaction. And this is a, this is a variation on coin join. So vanilla coin join is really not so great because the server knows where everything's going. The system I just described is such that the server can't tell where anything's going. So if the server doesn't know where things are going, 
this is you know a big step up from uh, most definitely from Dash, and then also from the Xiaomi and CoinJoin context for you know for for Wasabi Wallet because you're not relying on Tor here. You're relying on a system of basic cryptographic primitives as opposed to a routing network that's overlaid over top of the IP layer. So even if, I don't know, let's say the NSA tracks your connection to the server where this is occurring, you still have privacy because the privacy depends on a process that's, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't depend on the network path privacy. So what does this do? It creates N anonymity within an epoch. So if N of us uh, participate in one of these mixes, the outputs are indistinguishable so that you, know, you, you can see who the N people who <coughs> excuse me, paid into it are, but you don't know which of the outputs are theirs. <coughs> excuse me. Um, now, the last bullet here is handles change. The change handling situation here is a bit messy, and I'll get into that in a later slide. But suffice it to say this, if, you're, if you have inputs and they're unmixed, you have outputs and they're mixed, the change that comes back can be used to link these, uh, the inputs to the change output and potentially to the mixed outputs you have. Just as an example, let's say you send 12.34 coins into a mix, you get roughly 2.34 coins in exchange, and you get a mixed output for 10. What you can do is, is that you can look at this transaction, uh, add up the partial sums, all the partial sums of the inputs, and guess that the 12.34 that went in is linked to the 2.34 that came out. And then if you recombine that mixed output for the 10 with, with the 2.34 change you got, then your mixed output is indirectly linked back to your original inputs. So change handling here is tricky and it actually wasn't addressed at all in the paper, so we had to uh, add handling for that. So in short, how does this work? This works, uh, you know, what I have on the board, what I have up here is uh, a simplified version of the CoinShuffle++ algorithm. This is called the secure sum algorithm. Alice, Bob, and Carol each want to, each want to Everyone wants to sum their numbers A plus B plus C without any of the peers knowing the other peers' numbers. So uh, how do you do this? You, each peer partitions their number three ways to you know, A1 plus B1, or A1, uh, A1 plus A2 plus A3, you know, and so on down the line. Then what happens is, is that the, um, uh, Alice would send, uh, or excuse me, Bob would send B1 to Alice, Carol would send C1 to Alice, then the same thing happens in index two, so that uh, Alice would send A2 to Bob, and Carol would send C2 to Bob, and, and, you know, and so on for Carol. What this does is this allows each one of the peers to compute a vertical sum, so they can compute A1 plus B1 plus C1, and so on down the line. And the observation that ends up getting made and ends up feeding into what ultimately became CoinShuffle++ plus plus is, is that the sum of the horizontal sums equals the sum of the vertical sums. Now, I know this is kind of dumb. If you have like a, a grid of nine numbers, if you sum all the nine numbers up, you know, horizontally first, then vertically, you're going to get the same number. So it's, it's kind of a, you know, it's almost a trivial observation. But then when you uh, take this, you put it on, uh, you know, an adversarial public internet, you need to exchange these things, you need a key exchange, you need session keys. And then if you want to if you want to, instead of just creating a sum here, <coughs> you want to create a publishing process, what you end up doing is you publish and it, create, it creates a system of equations via this same sort of observation. So, so this basic idea can be made slightly more complex and end up being very, very useful for publishing mixed messages. <coughs> so how does, how does the change handling work? This is an important detail. Uh, change handling has to use fixed denominations. And the reason is, is um, if you're all familiar with the old version of Monero, that is before they added confidential transactions, you know that they used fixed denominations in the, you know, when they would send. So when you'd send a transaction, it would get broken into like thousands, hundreds, tens, ones, and so on. And then you'd recombine these various components in order to uh, send a new transaction. If you don't make the outputs indistinguishable, you can be vulnerable to linkage via that partial sum analysis that I had uh, referred to previously. 
And as you know, in order to decouple the change from the mixes from the uh, you know from the inputs and have it be very you know very concrete and and partitioned, you have to handle the change separately. So the change from a mix goes into a separate uh, you know a BIP32 account in you know in the Decred wall in DCR wallet, and then uh, you know then it gets sliced into smaller pieces. Those smaller pieces move into a mixed account, and once those pieces are slight you know once those mixed uh, once those change outputs are mixed, you can recombine them with other mixed outputs and not bleed privacy. That is the on the blockchain, all anyone or you know on the network, all anyone's going to see is the process of recombining lots of little pieces that aren't linked. And so, while you might be able to link them when they're recombined, you can't associate that with any single identity. What are the limitations? It's command line only to start. I you know I apologize. I know lots of people like to click on things and for it to be graphical, but we wanted to get the command line right before we push it out to uh, you know to the graphical wallet. It is only available to solo stakers, that is people who vote their own tickets, and people who are not staking. And the reason is, is that the voting service provider infrastructure isn't really compatible with anonymity right now. Because if you register for, you know, on a VSP to, uh, to vote your tickets, there's you know, an email address and you're like, uh, you know, you're Jimmy or Julie at some domain, and then even if you go to all the efforts to anonymize the tickets, then the stake pool operator knows who you are. So that's a, that's a shortcoming on the VSP front, and, and we've at least temporarily punted on, on resolving this. And the other thing to consider is, is that the, uh, the fee DNA, uh, partitions the anonymity set. So for example, if there's a stake pool with a fee of 1%, a stake pool with a fee of 2%, you can partition those two, those two groups of users, and that goes uh, a pretty long ways to de-anonymizing people. The other thing is, is that this uses a centralized server. The reason we went with a centralized server is it's obviously not ideal from a denial of service standpoint, but it, it works. Uh, the, since the server can't see anything, it can't know anything about the mixed outputs, using a centralized server is a good enough solution to get this out the door. So this is really a minimum viable product uh, consideration. How much anonymity are you gonna have? You, uh, there's about, 180,000 decred that go through the ticket purchasing process every day. So that's 1.8% of the total outstanding amount of DCR that go through this process. And you know, that's a that's a nice background, but then we 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 have a we have a look at the total amount of DCR that that's going to, you know, equate to because not everybody's going to opt into privacy. So roughly 50% of the coins are staked. Of the staked coins, roughly 50% of those are solo staked. And then of the solo stake coins, my estimate is that you know, within three to four months, roughly 50% of the solo stake coins will opt in to privacy. So if we follow that to the bottom, it's you know, one over two to the third, that's one eighth. It's a magic number here in California. And uh, uh, that, uh, that gives you 12.5% of all DCR being involved in the privacy system. So what we're going to end up with is a pretty decent anonymity set. Uh, if you compare this to Zcash, as of Q2 2018, roughly 3.6% of all, of all Zcash were in shielded addresses. So in a matter of three to four months, we'll have a, uh, you know, a mixed uh, an anonymity set of roughly three to four times uh, Zcash's uh, you know, with, just what we've, with just what we've discussed. I'll keep this one brief because this is kind of technical. The process for setting this up is kind of, uh, you know, it requires fiddling with, co with uh, configuration files. You have to set what the server is. That's the CSPP server, so the Coin Shuffle++ plus plus server. So it needs to know where it's going, the mix is going to happen. Currently, we have one set up at cspp.decred.org, and the mainnet mixing is on port 5760. I know ports, it, everyone was just about to ask me, what port is it on? Um, the CSPP server, uh, .ca, what we did is we created a, uh, a self-signed certificate, and the reason we did this is um, if you create a CA signed certificate, uh, nation state governments may be very keen to man in the middle you here. So we didn't want to use a CA signed certificate because you can uh, sort of sit in the middle, mash a button, and then uh, get in the middle and, and cause problems. The purchase account is where you're buying your tickets from, so when you, get, when you convert an existing uh, ticket buyer to, you know, to uh, be private, you need to purchase uh, from an account where the outputs are mixed. The idea, be, the, the idea there being that you don't want to uh, be mixing things that are all linked together because then that bleeds your privacy. 
there's a mixed account, and the mixed account is where mixed outputs go. So every one of these mixes, whether it's a ticket denomination or it's a, or it's a denomination below that, all of those end up getting routed to a mixed account because the point, you know, once you combine these mixed outputs, you can't tell who is, you know, who these outputs belong to. So that's why there's a mixed account. The change account is, you know, I had mentioned this before, you need to partition the change and make sure that it isn't, uh, it isn't getting mixed in with uh, mixed outputs. So the change account has to be handled specially and so you create a special account for that. Mixed change automates uh, or semi-automates, it uh, fully automates right now the process of mixing change. Mixing change is a pain, like you know, you might get a single uh, piece of change and then need to mix it into 40 or 50 pieces. And as a function of that, or uh, excuse me, it's actually 25 is the worst case, uh, you, know, 20, you know, 20 to 30 pieces, no one wants to be doing that by hand, so we have that as an automated process. And uh, the voting account. If you're going to be buying tickets, you need to set a separate voting account on every one of these tickets, which is yet another thing that is uh, an issue with a voting service provider. VSPs use a single address for, uh, for the tickets, and you want to get away from that. So where does this put us? Decred ends up with, you know, with the addition of this, uh, you know, of this mixing process. It generates a, a higher, uh, you know, a, a privacy that's better than Bitcoin and Dash, but not better than the, the, three, the three sort of groups of major privacy coins, Monero, Zcash, and the Mimblewimble coins. And the reason there is, is that this is just one facet. What we've done is we've created plausible deniability regarding the ownership of outputs. And that plausible deniability is just one component of privacy. So what are we going to add to really sort of round this out? We're going to add graphical support. That's the GUI support. Uh, we wanted, like I said, we want to make sure we get the command line right, so we can get the, U, the UI UX right on the graphical side. We will uh, make changes to how VSPs work in order to allow people who use VSPs to benefit from privacy. And the major change here is we're going to have to get rid of accounts. Accounts and the way uh, fees are paid is going to have to change drastically, so that instead of having an account, you would actually delegate t individual tickets to voting service providers and then uh, you know, set your preferences on a per ticket basis without an account as opposed to, uh, you know, as opposed to you know, being, identifying yourself as person at an email address setting a bunch of options. The uh, mixer server, we're going to uh, you know, either cluster it or make it into a, uh, you know, we're gonna integrate it into the consensus daemon DCRD. And so the purpose there is just to make it harder to DOS the, you know, to DOS the server. And we would want to integrate, if we, just to give you an idea of what we, how we would integrate it, in the same way that transactions aren't really complete until they're aggregated into a block in mind, we would create a separate sort of mixing mempool. And the mixing mempool would take draft, uh, you know, uh, it, would, it would take people who subscribe and want to mix, and then aggregate the mixes, and then you know, remove that from the mempool. So it would be uh, you know, another kind of mempool. We also plan to add confidential transaction support. I know I mentioned that there is the, uh, the potential for stealth inflation, but the potential for stealth inflation it can be limited by using different types of commitments for uh, confidential transactions. I really don't have time to get into that, but confidential transactions uh, are perfectly hiding and computationally binding. That's the opposite of what we would want in Decred. If you can stealth inflate Decred, you could wreck the entire proof of stake layer. So we really need to not even allow that as a possibility. So while other projects can you know, weather some stealth inflation and go, hey, we'll stop it if it shows up, we really can't do that. Uh, if, if stealth inflation shows up, somebody could basically show up and crater the currency, which would be very, very bad. And then the last thing that is uh, a, a big benefit of the process I described for CoinShuffle++ is that it's based on a key exchange and then generating session keys. The key exchange process can be made post-quantum secure, and that is something that I don't believe any other cryptocurrency has done yet. And uh, the motivation there would be that even in the case that someone has a, a large uh, quantum computer that has high-quality qubits, they can't grind out uh, you know, the, the calculations to strip privacy here. So, so that, would, that would give us a, a quality of mix that would be unparalleled in the space. And of these things, the two lowest hanging fruit are the graphical support, which you can expect not in this coming release, but the one after it. And then um, the post-quantum cryptography is it's probably a few weeks out, so that's gonna show up real soon. 
So the other, the other ones, the VSP changes, the integration into DCRD and the confidential transactions, those are more, so, say, six to 12-month time, uh, time horizons. And that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs>